In the San Francisco Bay Area, the housing crisis has become so severe that some have adopted a novel solution. They're living on boats and not quaint boats off Sausalito or yachts. According to the Wall Street Journal, about 100 people are living on a ragtag flotilla of barges, sailboats, and other vessels the paper describes as, quote, decrepit. They aren't all vagrants. Some hold jobs. One woman bought a boat for 15 grand because rent for a studio apartment had grown to $3,000 a month. You do the math, it'll pay for itself in less than half a year. It might sound like an adventure, but it's also third world. Just like tent camps, most boats are not designed to be lived on permanently. During storms, they can endanger lives and cause damage, huge amounts of damage. These flotillas are illegal, by the way, but it's like exploding housing prices. Bay Area government doesn't seem very interested in it or serious about fixing it. Whether it's San Francisco or New York or Seattle, when you think of homelessness, you think of major cities. But the homeless crisis is not limited to big population centers. Some of the hardest hit places are small cities and towns, where even a small homeless population can put massive strain on public service. For the latest installment in our series, Homeless in America, our producer Charlie Cougar went to Oregon, where one small charity is fighting to improve a desperate situation in Eugene. Watch. Our first stop in Portland, Oregon, wasn't meant to be work-related. It was for breakfast at an upscale bakery near the city's fashionable Pearl District. But when we arrived, we found this, a homeless man rifling through a trash can. In the parking lot, a dirty syringe. Homelessness in Portland looked a lot like what we'd seen in other cities. Lots of tents, lots of drugs. The city's permissive culture, its temperate climate, and generous social services attract vagrants and addicts from around the country. We met a woman called Liberty Hope at a cloverleaf off Interstate I-5. She says she came to the West Coast because she needed medical treatment for her leukemia. She moved to Portland after police in Washington State towed her motorhome. They illegally towed my motorhome. They didn't even have a tent. I got out where, with nowhere to go, um, but I couldn't leave because I still had treatments I had to do. Hope says she's blessed because the city shuttles her between a medical clinic and her tent. She hopes to get back to her home state of Montana once she's healthy again. How long do you think you'll be here? Um, I'm not too sure. I broke my foot this last winter, so it kind of set me back in, in, with my medical. Um, but I'm a miracle, so every day is a miracle. Similar tent encampments line Portland's highways. Virtually every open space in the city seems packed with people living outside and using drugs. This riverfront park downtown has a receptacle for used heroin syringes. Oregon is a relatively small state by population, but it has an awful lot of homeless people, more per capita than neighboring Washington or California. To get a sense of the scale of the problem, we drove to Eugene in the central part of the state. Eugene is a college town with the politics to match. Not surprisingly, it has an enormous homeless population. Ultimately, however, even the generosity of a place like Eugene has limits. On the night we arrived, multiple people were living in this makeshift structure. Two days later, the city had cleared the sidewalk and put up notices that it was going to scrap the belongings inside. Eugene is trying to get a handle on his homeless problem, but there are roadblocks. A major one? A ruling by the federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that has declared it's somehow unconstitutional to shoo away homeless people if there's no place for them to go. Eugene's leaders have responded by trying to erect tent cities on public land. One proposal envisioned building a homeless encampment in a parking lot at the center of downtown. So far, those efforts have failed. A local charity called St. Vincent de Paul has stepped in with its own solution. Well, this tent is a mash tent. Uh, it's a, a structure that was uh, used by the military in uh, some of our foreign deployments. Uh. Other cities on the West Coast have tried to provide housing for the homeless, usually at remarkable expense. San Jose, California, for example, is spending $37 million on a building that will house just 83 people. By contrast, St. Vincent de Paul's answer is simple and cheap. We put this whole section of tents up uh, with a work crew uh, in one day. Residents are assigned to bed and given a place to store their belongings. They're expected to make their beds every day to instill a sense of pride and self-worth. The shelter is open to anyone, including drunks and drug users. Those who stay get treated for addiction. The strategy essentially is the opposite of what cities like Seattle and San Francisco are doing. St. Vincent de Paul's goal is to get people off the streets and into an environment where they might actually recover. The housing isn't meant to be permanent. St. Vincent de Paul tries to get residents cleaned up and ready for long-term housing within just a few months. For many, the strategy appears to be working. What are the odds that in two years they're back on the streets? 
if they stay in programs and in association with people that are clean and sober, uh, chances are pretty good that they're going to stay out. Well, the homeless crisis appears to be getting worse pretty much everywhere in America. Rather than try to fix the problem, though, elites prefer to attack its victims. In the city of Seattle, one of the places hit hardest by this crisis, a woman has faced, believe it or not, backlash for seeking justice after she says she was raped by a homeless man with multiple arrest warrants. We'll interview a documentary filmmaker who told her story tomorrow night as our series on homelessness in America continues.